Wait for it. Wait for it. And we're live. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans. It's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just a couple of nerdy veterans and one chaos coordinator geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, sky is the limit, and space is the place. We are the podcast that puts the fun in dysfunction. So without further ado, we are going to let our guests introduce themselves. So we're going to start with you. Diana, can you introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers at home? Yeah, I'm uh, Deanna Fedorak. I uh, write speculative fiction, which means I write the range, the whole range of uh, science fiction fantasy. Uh, my debut novel, Children of Alpheus, is uh, currently out. And uh, I also have an ins- Asian-inspired fantasy uh, reader magnet on uh, my website that you could download uh, if you subscribe to my newsletter. Well, outstanding. And next we have Miss Julia V. Hi, everybody. I'm Julia V. And today my co-author, Ken B. Bell, is joining us. And uh, I always tell people this, but Ken and I started co-writing together when we were 13. We took like a 35-year hiatus and we're back at it. So um, since 2016, 2017, we've been writing together. We have over a million words together. Um, We are hybrid published. So we have our own independently published series called Seattle Slayers. And last year we debuted with Tor for a book called Ebony Gate, which came out in paperback this week. I think it's behind me. (laughs) Nice. And when she says 35 years, she really means dog years. They're not that old. Don't, don't listen to the lies. All right. And next last, but certainly not least, we have Mr. Ken. Can you introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers at home? Hey, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name is Ken Bibel, um, and I co-write with uh, Julia. And like she said, uh, we we have one writer brain between us, um, which is uh, a really amazing thing to be able to write with somebody who I've been friends with for so long. Um, and we currently write uh, mainly uh, Asian-inspired fantasy, uh, although we did start out in military science fiction way back when we started. Those are good books. I've read them. All right, and this uh, the next part of the introduction, dear listeners, how we first found them. But uh, with the exception of Ken, who we found through Julie, Julia, excuse me, uh, they've both been guests on the show. So when we were doing this episode, I knew they were perfect guests because I knew what they were writing. Uh, and from here, uh, Ken, since this is your first time on the show, you get to answer the religion questions. Are you ready for this? Hit me. All right, Star Wars, Star Trek, or Firefly? Star Wars and Firefly predominantly, uh, secondarily Star Trek. Okay. What is it about Star Wars and Firefly that speak to you? Uh, Star Wars probably because it just hit me when I was so young and impressionable. Um, and I I put up with it even through all the, the sequel movies. And um, I'm really loving the stuff they're putting on TV now. The, um, the Mandalorian, Acolyte, um, and uh what's the other one andor uh, i think they've really gone back to what really makes the story strong and I've, I've really always just loved star wars my whole life firefly actually got into really late um i didn't see it until the the series was complete and um i think when i watched it i got the same kind of vibes that i get from cowboy bebop and yeah. uh, that kind of space cowboy thing is really my jam yeah, so on the one hand, I kind of want more Firefly. I mean, obviously, you have the movie Serenity, but the other is, do I trust them not to mess it up? Oh, God, no. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no, don't touch it. <laughs> it's one of those things where if they want to go back into that world, they either need to use the same actors and take the story however many years forward it's been, or, uh, and I don't want to think of how long it is, so don't do the math for me, uh, or, like, their successors, like maybe their kids kind of go off, like like they did with Ghostbusters for the, mm. the sequel where it was the the kids of the original, like something like that, I think could work. I think the tough part would just be getting the aesthetic the same. Um, yeah. I, I think that's a big part of the appeal for me. I can see that. I kind of wish they brought ca- um, season two of Cowboy Bebop, but we never got it. So I know. You know I feel I like I wasn't able to get into the live action, um, but there were a lot of fans, you know. Yeah. That's one I, I haven't watch so i'm gonna have to fix that someday i tried watching the first episode and i couldn't do it it was uh something about live action adaptations of animation always rubbed me the wrong way are the animated ones good cowboy oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. yeah it's amazing yeah okay i'm gonna have to check it out then maybe we'll do a uh, an episode where we talk about that as the topic and we'll have you both back for that 
to get nerdy with us again. All right. And because we're polytheistic here at the Blasters and Blades podcast, Game of Thrones, The Wheel of Time, or Chronicles of Narnia? Uh, I got to I gotta confess here and say that I've read all the Game of Thrones books, um, although I probably won't bother to read the finish if he ever does get around to finishing it. I've never read Wheel of Time, and I've only read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So for me, only Game of Thrones. Okay. Do you normally like Grimdark? Is that normally your jam? I went through a really, really strong Grimdark phase. I think I read uh, Game of Thrones, and then uh, I started Joe Abercrombie about that same time. So I had a really quite dark few years of fantasy reading. <laughs> yeah, funny story. Like a million years ago, he mailed me a copy of game of thrones and there's a little tiny post-it where he writes like oh i'm really enjoying this it's great and i tried to read it and every chapter i was like this is so depressing <laughs> like i need to go eat a piece of chocolate to cheer myself up <laughs> so uh, on the one hand like i found out about game of thrones when the tv series came out and i generally have a rule if one comes first i'll either watch it if the movie was first or read it if the books were first but i don't like to start a series i know i will never get completion on so like do i really want to start game of thrones when i know i'll never get an ending i don't know and, I, and Sanderson, he's, he said he's not going to finish it for him so i mean who else is going to do it i feel like as fantasy fans we did you know have that big let down from George R. R. Martin. And also I think if you're a Patrick Rothfuss fan, like you just feel like, oh, maybe we'll never see the end of that series. Like it won't get finished, you know. And I've read Joe Abercrombie. Um one of my readers was absolutely convinced I had to read it. So I think it was like the Nine Fingers one, mm -hmm. the first one in that series. Yeah. But it was just too I didn't even like the good guys. Like I hated everybody in that book. It was just too dark. Yes. It's like I said, I had I had a really dark phase. <laughs> I mean, I don't yuck anyone else's yum. So if people like it, more power to them. Clearly, he's selling enough that he keeps writing, yeah. but it's just not for me. I, I don't it mind the brutal. dark. Lore. It, you know, it is brutal. I was watching the first episode of House of Dragon. I'm like, oh yeah, because there was a two year hiatus, and I was uh, I was like, oh yeah, it's um, they. I will not uh, spoil it uh, for the audience, but uh, they bring back violence in a big way. I generally have a rule that I don't mind a dark setting as long as there's a light at the end of the tunnel, but that light can't be the train coming to run you over. <laughs> like I have to know there's hope at the end, some, some sort of improvement, even if it's just baby steps forward. I mean, wow, life is dark enough already, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not yeah bad. A fan of tragedies. <laughs> not really. I mean, yeah. I guess we've all read the Shakespearean tragedies because you know it's mm -hmm. kind of required in high school and college if you're taking English classes, but but those aren't on level of what modern dark tragedies look like. <laughs> right. So, all right. So uh, because you haven't answered this one yet either, sir, what is your favorite dinosaur? Stegosaurus. I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's an excellent answer. That is a very popular choice just because the aesthetic, I think. Yes. I think it was one of the dinosaurs in the lane before time as well, which also helps. I thought that was Allosaurus. No? I don't know. It's been a while. I'd have to dig it out. But I I know the ones that people we tend to get a lot are the ones that were on the kids' shows we watched back in the day. I, I vaguely remember having to do a very large science report on Stegosaurus when I was younger. And I, and I think it imprinted on me. <laughs> okay. I can see that. All right. And um, coffee or tea? And how do you take it? coffee. And uh, this year I started doing um, pour overs at home, uh, what Julia calls fussy coffee, uh, because it takes like 15 minutes to make. Um, Too many she, steps. She would, she would be dead by the time my coffee was ready in the morning. So, <laughs> Okay. So first, I don't mind fussy coffee. Um, I was a barista through college. That's how I paid for my degree. So I get fussy coffee. But what do you mean by a pour over? Are you talking about like you just got the grounds and you do it like you'd steep the teas? Yeah, yeah. So I have a, uh, a little setup where I just pour the grounds into a um, uh, a V60, which is a just a, a drip coffee maker over a cup, and then just slowly pour the hot water over it. So it just basically makes the coffee right there. Is there a reason you like that flavor? Does it change the flavor, or do you just do you like the the zen the process, or what? 
uh, a little bit of both. Yeah, it's okay. it's a very kind of calming way to start a morning. It seems stressful to me <laughs> to wait that long <laughs> for my coffee. I'll be like, where is it? <laughs> because okay. you're too impatient. I have a one button machine. Yes, yes. Does it also like have a programmer where it can like start it for you so it's waiting when you get down like a timer? I had one of those, too fussy. <laughs> too many buttons. <laughs> okay, all right. So what's that? Uh, one button, it says coffee. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate it. Are you, are you a dark roast guy, Ken, or do you like the medium roast? What, what's your passion? I started with drinking mostly dark roasts and then uh, last uh, Christmas I went through uh, we, we took an extended trip through Asia and um, specifically uh, Japan and Taiwan and coffee culture in Japan and Taiwan is just freaking amazing. Like they have coffee nerds over there that would put everybody over here to shame. And uh, I started drinking medium roasts over there and finally it's like it started to click like what people were tasting. So I'm starting to try to get into that, but it's difficult and it's probably another very expensive hobby that I don't need. Wait, what are they tasting? What what is? Uh, people who like light and medium roast coffee will say that they get things like real jammy fruit flavors, um, citrus, uh, berry flavors, oh, wow. just coffee that doesn't taste like chocolate and hazelnuts and like dark flavors. Don't want. So it. I would. <laughs> what about I would have Vietnamese thought... coffee? If we're talking coffee, what's that? The Asian coffee is Vietnamese coffee. It's like super strong coffee with like oh, the condensed milk in it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's yeah. a different bean, right, Ken? I yeah, those are Robusta that. beans. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's not stuff Arabica. Yeah. That stuff will light your hair on fire. <laughs> See, I thought I was a coffee nerd, but apparently I got to give the hat to you now because I didn't even know that the coffee culture was big there. When you think Asia, you, you tend to think, at least I do, I, well, they're known for teas. So That's also well, quite excellent there. Yes. No, no, I understand. I didn't realize coffee was big there because for most people, it's coffee or tea. It's not both. So the, it didn't even occur to me. I, I, I learned something already and we're like 12 minutes in. The, the crazy thing is, is if you ever go to, um, if you ever go to Taiwan or Japan for coffee and you want, you want coffee, you can't have it in the morning. Um, the, the, most of the places just don't open in the morning. Culturally, coffee is not a morning drink over there. Culturally, it's something they drink in the afternoon. So a lot of coffee places won't even open until noon. Really? Yeah. Interesting. I'm used to, because like I said, I worked my way as through college as a barista. I'm used to seeing people with like the bloodshot eyes coming in at like five in the morning, needing their fix. So, you know, and, and I was their crack dealer and it worked for us. <laughs> so... And is we the love um, you because I'm grateful. <laughs> is the is the coffee house culture the same there as what we're used to here? Yes. You're, yeah. You're on the West Coast, so that's that's a lot more the the older coffee culture stayed. Like the coffee house is a place to hang out and you know engage in art and all that kind of stuff. It's still Definitely. strong on the West Coast, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and I think even just the sense of having a place to go and hang out that's like not a club. You know, and so the nighttime coffee scene is quite big in Asia. Okay. Yeah, you'll see that, that like in, in bigger cities like here in Vegas and Chinatown. You know, you'll go there and there'll be um, coffee houses with a lot of very good desserts in them as well, just to oh, kind of yeah. hang out and kick back. And yeah, it's, it's a nice change of pace. I'm going to have to investigate more. Call me curious now. All right. So do you ever mix it up with like regular drip coffee or K curing the K-cups or any of that kind of stuff? Or is, are you a purist? Oh, no, no. I, I'm, I'm, I'm fussy, but I'm not that much of a snob. I'm not the kind of person who's going to like bring his coffee gear on a trip with him. I'll just drink whatever is available to me. So um, <laughs> okay. my, my wife's got a Keurig machine downstairs and, you know, if, in a pinch, it, it'll do. <laughs> The only thing I can't do is instant. I just can't. But that's that's more because of the memories. That's like that's if a, there's, that's like a last resort. <laughs> and you know, I've heard that that's actually kind of like coming into like a, a kind of a new renaissance where there's like really gourmet instant coffee being made now. Yeah, I actually buy the instant now, and it's like good. It's hard to explain. It's not your parents' Folgers crystals anymore. 
So when I think instant, I'm remembering the ones that came in the MREs, and we used to put that under your gums, like dip, to get the caffeine straight to the blood system because we were <laughs> exhausted. So like when I was in Iraq doing convoys, in theory, you're supposed to get eight hours off a day to rest and recuperate from, you know, in the combat zone. They got the brilliant idea of doing 10 on, four off, 10 on, four off, which doesn't quite math out. And then if you're actually an NCO like I was, that meant the first hour off, you got to take care of your people and then do the debrief and resupply and then you get two hours of sleep and then the hour before you got to be up and getting ready for the same stuff so i was literally every 12 hours i'd sleep too so the caffeine in the bloodstream was just that was that was good um in fact i i've written about this in my newsletter people ask me what the scariest point in iraq was and they expect some sort of battle story and i'm like realizing i when i woke up in my gun truck that my driver and gunner was asleep too and we were still driving down the road that was the scariest <laughs> point in iraq <laughs> so it's just one of those things. We lost as many people to rollovers as we just from exhaustion as we did the combat when I was there in 05. It was insane. Wow. So for me, like all, all I see is instant and I'm remembering sticking it under my gum and I'm like, I'm not that desperate anymore. <laughs> so, all right. Well, let's get us to the topic that brought us here. I had fun talking about coffee and that was very nerdy and I appreciate it, Ken. You already get like cold stars in my book. So, <laughs> Obviously, like the topic here is uh, Asian inspired fantasy. I, I imagine that could inspire sci fi too, but I know classically a lot of fantasy novels were basically proto European cultures in, you know, Ad Magic and Dragons. So, what do you think makes Asian um, a, a good inspiration for those same kind of stories? There's no wrong answer. Everybody go whenever you, if you got something to say. I, I guess I would say predominantly the world building um, and uh, some of the mythology. Like, so growing up, like the first real Asian author I read was Amy Tan, like uh, in the 90s. And uh, I remember picking up the book and even though it's set, you know, in contemporary society, she's talking uh, to her mother, they're remembering, uh, you know, or her her life in China and, you know, some of the mythology with some of the other books, like the kitchen gods, wife, bone setter's daughter. And, uh, and I thought it was really cool. Cause I'm like, Hey, this, this feels strangely familiar. Like, you know, from, you know, stories, uh, from my mom's uh, side of the family. Uh, so I would say like the world building is a big part of it. Um, like the, I just finished reading Jade City by Fonda Lee and it had a very, yeah, it had a very like Hong Kong, you know, kind of feel the old Bruce Lee, you know, Jackie Chan kind of thing. And uh, the magical elements there, you know, um, was Jade, which, you know, is a big, uh, you know, a big deal in uh, Asian folklore. Um, so the folklore uh, and all those kind of things, it's just, it's a, it's just a nice change, you know, to read, um, uh, sometimes for me, you know, something different. And I also think it's uh, good for a younger generation because like my daughter, I didn't like teach her this, you know, cause if I buy her book, she's not going to read it. But if I let her pick it out, you know, uh, then she'll read it. And I was talking to her, I'm like, Hey, what, what do you want to read? And she's like, um, I, I want a book with an Asian character. And, and she's, she's picking out books and I'm like, all right, I did something right. You know? <laughs> so I, I do think the world building uh, is a big part of it. And, um, and a little bit, some of the relationships uh, that you'll see between um, the respect for the elders is a really big thing. Um, and that kind of struck me when uh, there was a scene in the book to where um, one of the main characters who was like the, the family head of a uh, basically, you know, uh, underground, you know, family uh, is confronted by his grandfather, who uh, clearly uh, age is starting to take a toll on him and his ability to think clearly. And grandpa's just real nasty and confrontational, but he's not he's not talking back to him. You know, he's not he's trying to hold his own and be polite and be respectful. But that's like a big um you know, in Western culture, it's not unusual to see like, uh, you know, teenager might flip off their parents. <laughs> you know, um, uh, Asian culture, you don't do that to your elders. That's uh, that's a big no-no. Yeah, I, I couldn't do imagine doing that. 
I, I would never, I'd still be looking for my teeth if I did that to my mom. <laughs> well, I know. I feel like as a Gen Xer, like you didn't, you, you yeah. didn't talk back to your parents. That just was not a thing, right? Yeah. Or your teachers even. Um, but I, I, I agree. Like the world building and the role of, um, I guess, the role of the individual versus the role of society is a bigger question in Asian led fantasy. Um, okay. because these are competing needs right whereas here i think it, if you read a western based fantasy with the classic adventure um, um setting or goal you have the protagonist who is the the typical hero's journey um mm -hmm. and and that is very enjoyable ken and i grew up reading a lot of that but now that we're writing we love being able to um put together a narrative where we think these themes are something we want to explore um, culturally, right? For our Asian families and backgrounds, we want to see them on the page. We want to um, build, like put the world building of our childhood and our parents' stories into the stories so that the next generation can read them. So preserving okay. memories. I like that. Go on. And um, I think uh, what, I, I, one of the things I liked when Julie and I decided to write something with Asian myth is just that the, the, the depth of the, the library to, to, to draw from is so deep, right? There are so mm -hmm. many um, different Asian ghosts and monsters that all have their own individual unique stories and even if the stories are only just like very tiny things like this ghost lives in you know under these stairs for this reason right um there there's still like a, a nugget of a story there that you can then develop into something else and blend it into the world and make the world building feel that much richer um and and it's all just incredibly different than the, than the Proto-European stuff. And it, it makes me feel really good to, to be able to put stuff like that, like the kinds of stories that, uh, that my mom would tell me when I was really little and try and put some of that on the page. Um, and then also then see other readers, you know, catch it and say like, okay, yeah, I recognize this. And I think that feels really good. I imagine if you're talking Asian culture, you have the same problem I noticed when I was writing a book with James Ward about Egyptian culture, is that the culture history is so long. You say this god or this story, okay, what era are you talking about? Because oh, yeah. it's going to be yeah. different along oh, the lines. It, yeah, it, it was even more than that, right? Like we were doing a bunch of dragon research and it wasn't even like you could just generically talk about dragons in China. It had to be like dragons from the Ming dynasty on or dragons from the northern part of this you know country right as opposed or as opposed to dragons in the southern region which had a totally different um origin story it was uh it was a lot <laughs> are the it's a good anthropological thing when you go to like the museum like a natural history museum and you run into like if they have like different sections the asian section or um you know, uh, you go to Western European or whatever part. And I always get a kick out of that because when I have in the Asian section and it's not like the other ones aren't impressive, but you're like, this is from 5,000 BC, you know, <laughs> you're like, and if they had like it all doped out language, you know, civilization, their culture and everything. And, uh, they were recording it and the art. And, uh, so it's, uh, it, it's pretty incredible for me to see and it's something I enjoy as a hobby. So it sounds like part of the allure is being able to honor your past, which I think everybody should be able to do. Yep. Yeah, and um, also just um, sh I, like we're st storytellers, right? So like mm -hmm. sharing new vibrant stories for your audience that may not have that awareness, right? Is also, there's there's something very enjoyable about doing that too. And you have the benefit that, like, I feel like a lot of fantasy, traditional fantasy readers are also history nerds. And you get to a point where, like, just like you did, you could do with George R. R. Martin, you know exactly what period of history he's basically cutting and pasting and fitting into the into the world. When yeah. you start looking at 
using other cultures as inspiration, you get that sense of newness and wonder again, because I don't get all the references. And sometimes that makes it fun. Yes. I was talking to another author about that. And he said, it's fun for him sometimes just to go look up something. Right. Because we love to learn. There's like that part of us that is like, oh, this is new. What is that? Right. And we have the the unique benefit. Because, you know, obviously, I don't want to say anyone's age, but uh, if you grew up before the ebook revolution, like you were limited by your library and eventually you read all the books in the sci-fi section. So now you're reading all the fantasy books and then whatever the lend lease could get from other libraries. And so I find people our age tend to be more widely read outside of their own sort of niche interests. And this is kind of incorporating that because now you get to experience other places again, like that when you first find that new book that, oh, I've never been here before because it's a new universe, you can get that all over again. And it doesn't feel, I would, I would imagine it's not as derivative for most people. Yeah, I mean, there's something to be said for like the comfort, cozy read, right? Where you pick up something, you're like, this looks just like the D&D manuals from 1985, right? And so there, or the Dragonlance books that you had in the mass market paperback size. So the beloved and the familiar is, is also um, a staple, right? For most fantasy readers. But I think uh, the element of exploration. I love how you pointed out that we probably read everything we could get our hands on in the library and they like start to run out like in the section. <laughs> so you had to then start reading like the Westerns because you're like, well, I've already finished all the other genre fiction. Yeah, I had <laughs> in the little local library. I was a staple. I'd, it was only about two miles from my house. So I'd walk there <laughs> every during the summer, right? What else are you going to do? Um, so yeah, it's, and you get, with uh, you mentioned some of the the culture is different. Do you find the tropes in when you are using other cultures are different, or are those pretty universal? There's some universal tropes, but um, I mean, if if you've like the kinds of things that we drew on when we when we wrote the Phoenix Horde series, I think we were probably drawing on things on the kinds of tropes that you would see in like the the John Woo movies uh, from the the eighties and nineties, and then like the the Wuxia uh, TV series and uh, and movies from about the same period, um, and those those have those have a lot of set tropes in uh, in and of themselves, but they're they're different from the kinds of things that you would see in Western media, I think. So I know in Europe, if I'm, it's been a few years since English lit in college, but it was the three act or the five act structure. And I vaguely remember that Asian stories tended to have a four act structure. Is that something you apply when you write your stories or do you keep the structure your English readers are more used to? Uh, we did not use, I think it's called Kisho Tenketsu. Like we did not use the four act structure. Um, for me as a reader, I find them interesting, but it leaves me with questions. And so I actually prefer the three act structure. Uh, so we still write that way. Okay. What about you, Diana? Um, yeah, you know, I didn't think about applying the structure, you know, now that I read it, it's, but you know, if it's a good fantasy novel, I think it's going to have an epic, you know, feel to it. Um, like you mentioned tropes and like, so one, because I've been reading like some YA Asian fantasy with like Su Lin Tan and Elizabeth Lim. And I feel like I was got like giggling, you know, during some parts of it, what was happening, you know, it's the main character. Cause I feel like in, um, in Asian fantasy, it's like, or at least the stories I remember, it wasn't like unusual. Like if you, um, for maybe a parent or older relative to do, something kind of awful to the kid as if they, especially if the kid shames the family, right. Or if they're really unattractive or, or something like that, you know, then it's like, who, who Shingli? No, we don't know who she is, you know, stick them in the closet. You know, when the government officials come, we, we don't know who that is, you know? Um, and in like the one book with Elizabeth Lim, the curse was, there was a bowl on top of the girl's head. So no one could tell she was a princess. And I'm like, Oh, this is the most Asian thing ever. You know, to a lot of, of things. I was like laughing because like, and she couldn't talk either. So she couldn't, so that was the curse, you know, that she was trying to break. And I'm like, yeah, I, 
I really feel that, you know? <laughs> um, so, so that's an example of like, you know, one trope. Um, it's, it's almost like, you know, not to compare it to Western, but I think in the Western um, stories, they had the original grim tales were, they, they were grim, you know, it's like yes, kids they were. eaten and, and gotten chopped up and, and like, and those stories like still are a little bit, I feel like rattling around in, you know, uh, the, the Asian culture, or at least the stories, you know, my mother told me and I was like, what, what happened to, to Canada this story? And she's like, I don't know. That's just how the story goes. <laughs> um, but uh, that's a, uh, so, so that's an example of something, you know, different you might encounter in Asian fantasy. Yeah, I think it also feels familiar, right? Like if the protagonist is struggling against the system, um, if it's an Asian-based fantasy, the system may be like Confucianism, right? Like the hierarchy, the rules, the rules of society, the stricture. But that's also a trope in um, Western stories with royals, right? Like you, the poor little princess or the poor little rich girl trope. It's the same, right? They have everything, but they have so many rules that they are a prisoner of their society. So I think that it feels familiar, familiar to readers, whether or not it comes from like an Asian based fairy tale or whether or not you're reading a Royal with phase type of story. Right. I just want to say that I, I did read uh, six crimson cranes and, um, the, the whole bowl on her head thing just did not phase me at all. I was like, okay, yeah, this is totally normal. But, but now yeah, that that's normal. It's fine. Like, yeah, I, could, I could totally see how someone, someone who doesn't have, you know, this kind of culture inculcated in you would be like, well, just take the bowl off. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you say shame culture, and I can't help but picture Mulan, the animated one with the, the little dragon. Dishonor on your house. Dishonor, yeah. <laughs> Dishonor on your cow. <laughs> all right. We're going to pause for a moment while we shamelessly shill for the man, and then we'll jump right back into this topic. From R. Max Tilsley, author of Brains, the post-apocalyptic pick-a-path adventure with more than 60 endings, comes the Susie Steele adventures. Susie has a heart of gold, a set of bad dreams, and a hidden destiny. Six months ago, Susie's father went to work and never returned, leaving Susie to her hobby of chasing away nannies, that is until the mysterious and glamorous Cassandra roars into her life, driving a red sports car and promising to be the best of friends. When Susie stumbles on her father's secret lair, a world of magic, ghosts and mysteries beckons. Can she discover the truth, avoid being expelled from school, and keep a ruthless secret society off her back? She's to have a ghost of a chance, she'll need the help of her best friends, one grumpy cat and a whole lot of daring. The Susie Steele Adventures from R. Max Tilsley. Book 1, The Steel Trap. Book 2, The Steel Bite. Perfect for readers 9 plus. Available in print and ebook. And if you want something that's a little different, those books are definitely different. They're set in Australia, so you get the weird spelling and the funny talking and have at it, people. Are they choose your uh, adventures? Yeah, but you can't say that because those are trademarks. So it's a pick right, a path right. or choose a path, like whatever oh, you want to call oh. it. You just I can't like do that. choose one. Like nice. the revival of the of the. Uh, I'm glad to see somebody's doing that. He's done several of them. Um, he's got a whole formula. If you look at him when he's planning it, it does look like he's a serial killer. Just full disclosure, because of all the little strings and the pens and stuff. But I'm, um, you know, that's that's how you do those stories, I guess. I. My hair falls out just thinking about I, trying to organize Can't you imagine that. like the logic puzzle of making that work? <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of those things where you got to make sure every tree follows out somewhere, so each one gets an ending. I just I shudder to think. I'm better <laughs> him than me. <laughs> All right, so do you? So one of the tropes, for instance, in YA fantasy is that you always fridge the family, right? Because how else do you have kids out there doing all the crazy stuff when mom and dad would be like, hell no, you're not going. So you just kill the family and bada bing, bada boom, you got your start. Is that a trope when you see YA fantasy in Asia? Is there even such a thing as YA fantasy there? Or is, is that more of a Western thing? Um, I don't know if it's a Western thing. It's certainly part of the Hollywood formula, right? That your protagonist should be an orphan of some sort. Um, but we chose to not unalive the parents for our protagonists uh, in in uh, Ebony Gate and Blood Jade. And it is quite 
a family saga, right? Like it's a story of how they overcome um, kind of this, this uh, societal evil that they are facing. Right. And they do it together, even though it's not her, it's not her intended plan, but she'll always be there for her family. I like that. Um, so with your um, inspired fan, uh, Asian inspired fi fantasy, Diane, is that something where you did that as well? Did you keep the family around or did you get rid of them just so that way you could have a, the main character be an island? Uh, well, it's a short story, but there okay. is a hook in there um, to her mother and, and why she does what she does. So it's a uh, female samurai. Um, so, and I do, I did really enjoy that. I, I do enjoy that aspect of family aspect because um, of it when I read Asian fantasy and, um, and another trope, because I was looking at your book, Julia and Ken, you totally had me at the Ebony gate. You totally had me at a female John wick. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, you know, uh, download it uh, after this podcast. Um, but uh, so the martial arts, you know, trope is pretty, um, uh, pretty heavy in uh, Asian fantasy as well, even though it's, you know, mainstream, you know, martial arts worldwide now. Um, uh, uh, it's in a lot of the adult Asian fantasy, I've noticed. Now, you said female John Wick. Does that mean you hurt her dog? No. Oh, no, 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 no. She has a lion. It's fine. Oh, okay. He's not a dog. <laughs> I am now intrigued. I'll mess with a girl with a lion, apparently. She has a foo lion, and the running joke is that everyone thinks it's a dog, right? With bigger teeth, I'm sure. <laughs> so was that um, something that's cultural that you used the lion for, or was that just because it was different? Uh, the foo lions are always these um, protectors of of buildings that you see, like they're always in a pair. There's usually a male and a female in the front of every building in they're in stone. Um, there's a very specific magical reason for why her companion is this foo lion that she wears as a pendant most of the time, but she can whistle him full size. Um, and that's part of the exploration of how this magic system works too, which uh, we had a lot of fun building into the story. Nice. So when you were building um, the magic system, were you using existing beliefs from, from Asia or were you just mixing in kind of modern fantasy beliefs and magic with Asian flavoring? We started with, um, with, with a lot of focus on, on dragons. We, we knew that we wanted something to do with dragons and uh, there's a, it's actually a fairly, Julia knows better than I do, but a, a fairly recent um, Avengerization of the Chinese dragon myth, uh, where they they took a bunch of disparate dragon stories and turned them and united them under a banner called the Nine Sons of the Dragon. And they gave them all uh, kind of um, standardized names and, you know, like this guy does this and this guy does this and this guy does this. And we we started from there and said, well, what if, what if we had people who grew up around the dragons um, and ended up kind of like soaking up the dragon power, like, like they were living next to like a nuclear reactor. And so we, we started with powers that were similar to what the dragons were and then just kind of like spun out from there. Yeah, so it does feel very elemental. And we've had f reviewer feedback that sometimes it feels a little bit like Avatar the last airbender so um i would say that it it was specifically tied to wanting the magic system to feel like they were descended from dragons and eastern dragons are different they're really about controlling the weather um and they usually live near water features like rivers and lakes and so it has a very different feel than um western dragons which breathe fire and it's all that sort of ash and brimstone and um, knights who get eaten by dragons. It's a very different type of archetype. I can see that. But uh, I would say being compared to Avatar is a good thing. <laughs> yes. So, I did take thing. it as a huge compliment. <laughs> so as long as we're not talking like the James Cameron version, because, you know. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no blue people. <laughs> no blue people. 
and unobtainium. Um, so is this um, world that you're building, is that set in, because I, I'm going to look it up now because I'm interested. Is it set in the modern world with uh, like urban fantasy kind of vibe or is it actual epic fantasy style set in another world? It's set in San Francisco. It's totally urban. Um, you know, our agent had to pitch it as contemporary fantasy because Trad Pub was not necessarily buying urban fantasy at the time, but it's a straight up urban fantasy. That's what I call it. So did you get to go to any cool places when you were doing research for that novel in San Francisco? I mean, I love San Francisco and it's not that far from me. So, um, I, and I grew up there. So yes, I did do a lot of cool things like that. And, and I would get these funny texts from Ken. He would be like, hey, Julia, what's the name of the parking garage where like you come out in Chinatown and it's like the old guys play on top? And I'm like, well, nobody parks there. <laughs> If you, it's like hyper local, I'm like, you have to park at Stockton and walk through the tunnel, right? And he's like, no, no, I want the atmosphere of that parking garage. <laughs> it, it's such a tiny city. San Francisco's only seven by seven miles. Um, but the really fun stuff was for book two, for Blood Jade, we got to go to Tokyo. Well, we haven't physically, I mean, I didn't physically go. Ken went to Tokyo, but we'd already written the book at that point. So we were using <laughs> maps. Google Maps are your friend. <clears throat> I did get to confirm that we got a lot of a lot of details right, so that was Yay. good. <laughs> and you could write it off on your taxes, winning. Right. <laughs> Every little bit counts. <laughs> right, right. So, do you plan on writing any like more, like more of the epic fantasy set in sort of medieval style worlds um, as uh, with your fantasy next? Or are you going to keep it contemporary? You know, I. I would love to write a secondary fantasy, but realistically, um, I think we'd probably stay within the post-industrial world. So still cars, still electricity. Um, and that's probably going to be our approach for a while. Okay. What are, what are your plans with that, Diane? I, I know you said you have the short story. Are you going to write more with that universe? Um, yes, I am planning on writing an Asian fantasy as soon as I finish my trilogy. I'm in uh, my last book, my second books uh, with my editor. I'm with a small press. Um, so, but I have the concept flesh out. It will probably be of a Southeast Asian flavor. So. Is it going to be a secondary setting or is it going to be more modern world? No, it's going to be, um, it's going to be a, a little agent, if you will. So, mm -hmm. so well, I'm, I'm, I'll be shooting for like epic fantasy, if you will. I dig it. Now, are the the if you go that far back for like the epic fantasy vibe, and I know Julia and Ken, you said you're not writing that right now, but would would what people see in the in that world look vastly different than what they're used to in like say Tolkien esque fantasy, or is there going to be some overlap? Do you guys think? Well, oh, if you're going to compare it to Tolkien, I mean, <laughs> you know, sure. Um, uh, there'll be some differences, you know, uh, just for the world building. I think it's just the scale and, you know, how you do the magic is, is going to be the key piece of it. And like Julia said, it's like a lot of, cause I'm, I'm debating it in my head right now. If um, it should be like elemental, uh, which I feel like is, feels natural, you know, if you're writing uh, Asian fantasy or um, based on some other principle. So I'm still sorting it out. Okay. I, I think that um, if there's a similarity and, and I love Tolkien, I used to reread um, the Lord of the Rings all the time. Uh, I would say that one of the most fun aspects of the Lord of the Rings is that it's a journey story. And Ken knows I love stories involving a lot of travel <laughs> and, and Avatar The Last Airbender is a journey story, story, right? Like every season they're going to a different kingdom, like the Earth Kingdom or the Fire Nation or whatever. So I feel like in that regard, it is a um, similar and familiar feel if you're going to do an epic fantasy that is an Asian fantasy. Like your readers who like journey stories will still see that. I know the architecture is definitely going to give it a different flavor. Just if you look at Asian architecture from the period versus what they were putting up in Europe, it's definitely going to be more whimsical, I would say. 
just you know comparing what, what exists now. You want to kill me, and uh, Julia knows this from uh, from our draft because we'll be drafting something, and I'll put a new character on the page, and I'll just put in brackets. Please describe this person's clothing, because I suck at describing clothing, and that's that's for something set in contemporary <laughs> San Francisco. <laughs> and if I had to do that for secondary medieval Asian culture, <laughs> you'd be like, what do they wear? <laughs> yeah. And I know I would waste, you know, three hours a day researching <laughs> accuracy of clothing for the time period <laughs> and the class and the region and the, the time of year and the weather. <laughs> well, and the running joke for Wuxia or like Shensha, the fantasy, like like Legend of the Condor Hero, which is so beloved in Asia and has sold 300 million copies just to put that out there. Um, Holy crap, that's a lot. It's a lot. It's beyond your comprehension, right? Like as, as a, uh, to because like to make the New York Times bestseller list on fan, on fantasy book, you would have to sell five thousand copies, mm -hmm. right? So this series, which started, I think, started in the seventies, has was originally a serial and then became novelized. Um, and it's that. I think it started uh, in the forties. No, I think if you look him up, he I think he started writing in the sixties or seventies. He had a mm -hmm. newspaper. And he, right. he was doing it to increase circulation of his newspaper. It was very successful. Um, so, you know, <laughs> he, he, uh, he had this beloved series, but there's one road in China. Now, as we know, China is a very large country. So it's kind of hilarious because all these misadventures with the thieves and the bandits and everybody, it's on the one road and everyone stops in the same village in the same tavern to eat, you know, their meal of medieval Chinese porridge, you know. <laughs> That could be interesting. I'm, we're going to have to put together a list of recommended uh, fantasy that fits uh, Asian inspired, and we'll just start doing some of those as book reviews. That should be fun. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, I have a list. I totally send it to you. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll get the readers to read it or the viewers at home to read along with us. That could be fun. Because um, I, I will say that, you know, when you read a lot, you do start to see this. It all feels the same. So it's always fun when you can find like insp inspirations that come different places just because it it's that newness again, right? Like when you're like you're a kid again, reading for the first time. So. Yes, there are many books that I wish I could read a, for the first time. So, Ken, are you? How are you with the food? I need to know the the Asian food. <laughs> oh, we love writing about food. Okay. <laughs> food is, is it, food is so much fun. Um, we uh, we actually had a uh, a scene at the end of. Uh, near the end of Blood Jade, the, the sequel that comes out next month, where mm -hmm. uh, all our characters sat down at um, at a huge Kaiseki banquet in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, I only really had room to describe like two or three dishes that came out. But I mean, I could have just gone on forever and, and wasted everybody's time for another three chapters. <laughs> we love writing about food. And it's funny because like recently I picked up a book, which is a... Um like a modern urban fantasy retelling of Greek Olympus. And at one point in the story, she has a meal. Someone brings her takeout. They don't describe the eating experience at all. They literally just talk about like she ate and I'm, and I'm dying as a reader. I'm like, well, what did she have? Right? <laughs> I feel like it's important to me. And so it always shows up in our writing. I, I get that. And it's one of the things I remember the one of the few classes I remember from is my undergrad. We took a food on it's called the history of food. And we what we were actually talking about is when people think ethnic food, be it Chinese, Japanese, American, Mexican, whatever, what we really are thinking about in our head is what uh, like festive food, holiday food, because that, obviously that would be like a, assuming Americans eat Thanksgiving dinner every meal. Right. Let's just that's not <laughs> what we do all the time. And so getting to dive into that and show people stuff they're not used to seeing, that could be fun. Although when you're dieting, probably hard to read. <laughs> so, um, and you could always do taste testing for, you know, science, right? You gotta, gotta get it just right. <laughs> yes. For science. <laughs> this, also this, this makes me think that now, <laughs> now I, now I need to write something about some, some awful like curse around like a durian fruit or something. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> cannot, cannot like that. <laughs> and, and that's the thing is you've got such a wide option based on what era, what region, what season, as far as what they're going to eat, which 
so much room for, for playing around, I would imagine. Now, when you want food written for you, Julia, do you want it described the presentation or just the flavors? Because I know, for instance, going to like we talked about the coffee house, that's experience is different in a coffee house than just drinking it on your front porch, right? Like, so some of the eating experience, the experience is as much as a part of it as the food. I feel like it's a, another way for me as a reader to connect to the character. So if the character loves this flavor profile or this type of food or, you know, the or has an opinion about the preparation of this food, like I care about that. Like I want to know, right? So here I'm reading this series that's set in Greece and I'm thinking, oh, I would love to know what they were eating and what it tastes like and what that experience was like for the protagonist. And that's just another way for me to get a window into them, right? This is why we're friends. <laughs> I <laughs> tell you the right things. It's, a, it's also the smells. Right, you're oh, just yeah. like, oh, yeah. oh, you're like oh, that transports me to grandma's house, or you know, uh, so I mean, there's just so much you could do. I feel like from a writing perspective with food, um, is that something you do, Diane? Um, well, I enjoy it. It's also the you avoid the talking head device. You know the you know that your characters, if they're dining, you know, or they're over a meal. And, you know, in a scene, there's a lot of movement and stuff and what they eat and how they eat it and what dishes they pick also tell you something about the characters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will I will say, you guys, if all three of you are writing Asian inspired fantasy, you are at a disadvantage because Microsoft Word Spelltrack probably hates you. Oh, when you start yeah. trying to write. Things. I feel like it's true for all fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember I've written because um, I used one of my beta readers who was from Sri Lanka. So I wrote his name in as a just a bit character. And the narrator came back. It's like, no, JR, just no, shorten it because <laughs> he couldn't <laughs> pronounce it. So I imagine you get that too. We do get requests um, from the voice. Um, from the voice actor and from the audio director at Macmillan. And so Ken and I, for each book, have had to put together like a sound glossary pronunciation. We've been really fortunate because we've had like family and friends record things for us that are native speakers. So we can figure out what does it sound like. Right. So you're going to run into the same problem that military sci-fi readers have, because some of the words you don't think are like, oh, of course, you, everyone knows how to say route or Corman or whatever. And then those are the ones people get wrong because you didn't think to tell them there was a right way to say it. Totally true. Because uh, some of the times where you get words that are vastly different words, but and spelled the same way. And if you, they don't know which one, it can get, get interesting. So um, when you guys are writing these, is there do you feel like it's more important to get the vibe right, like to set the ambiance or to get the specific facts? I feel like we're fantasy writers. We're already writing fiction. We're not really about facts. <laughs> so <laughs> we're, we're all about vibes, right? Um, so we do want scenes to feel a certain way or we want our reader to feel a certain way after they experience um the scene that's not to say we don't do a ton of research especially when it's yeah. fun like weapons research because you know if you get us researching a historical sword we will completely kill many hours of time doing that and you have to buy one just so you can know how it feels right for Ken? Research. we had one forged from our book oh wow that is cool so she cares hold, on, hold on, and give me a second. I'm going to put you solo screen so you can show everybody. So uh, Emiko carries the uh, broken sword of truth in uh, Ebony Gate. She's carrying this broken piece of her past around uh, for almost the entire book. And when I found out that our friend John owns a sword store and could actually have one made for me, um, I jumped on it. You have the right kind of friends. <laughs> yes. Well, so John Kang is an author. J he writes as J.C. Kang, and he writes Asian fantasy and has really um, done fantastically well as an author. But he also is a sword dealer in Virginia, uh, and he has these contacts, um, you know, that, that could get us this sword forged in Asia. Uh, and it was kind of funny trying to describe, like, no, it's supposed to be broken. 
Do you remember that, Ken? How they were like, are yeah, you sure? I, I, uh, <laughs> I actually remember one specific uh, email chain where they're like, do you want us to send you all the all the extra parts? And I was like, I, no, I don't need the extra parts. I just want the sword, <laughs> the broken part. <laughs> <laughs> So is that something the character carries the other the broken pieces, or does she just carry what what we see? She just carries what she saw. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Do you guys uh, do? I'm just curious. Do you have swag? I'm just thinking just how rich the world is here. You know, as far as like the graphics. You know, like that that to me is always big in fantasy, um, with the illustrations. We were yeah. so fortunate to work with some very talented artists, yeah. one of whom is related to Ken. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, my daughter. She, my daughter actually, this is the bookmark for Ebony Gate. That, that is, that that is awesome. on point, like no pun intended. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a perfect bookmark, yep. So I actually had these made first. And yeah. then when I when I found out I could have the sword made, um, I actually just sent John a picture of the bookmark and I said I want it to look like this. Yep. There you so go. if your daughter has a website where she sells her art, get it to me and we'll link that in the show notes as well. No reason we can't throw more business her way if she's making a career at it. Um, was that something that you the description came and then she drew it, or did she draw it and then you adjust the description to what she created? Oh no, we're the worst art clients ever. I had I had I had everything in my head, and <laughs> I had her go through several versions uh, before we landed on what we thought was was uh, true to the way we described it in the book. Yeah, I mean, we had written the book first, but when you prepare an art brief for the actual artist, you probably need to be a little bit more specific, right? Uh, the, than maybe the vibes in your book. I, I have a perfect get out of jail free card because I'm colorblind, so I can pass the buck. I'm like, of course I don't do my own art. <laughs> and if you're not colorblind, you can fake it. I give you permission as a fellow <laughs> colorblind person so you don't have to do your own art. Briefs. Just pass the buck. <laughs> uh, we often have notes to each other, like in our drafting, where it'll be like, what does this look like? Right? Or like, you know, and so that, that process... Um, it, the visualization aspect is actually, I think, very helpful as a craft thing for writers, right? So like working with artists force you to kind of elevate your um, game as far as description. Now, as as co-authors, are you um, are you doing different POVs and, and how has that process come together with like the plot? Are you whiteboarding it out together, just brainstorming? As you go along, <laughs> or do you figure it all out ahead of time? We we talk a lot on the phone. We're mm -hmm. we're probably on the phone four or five times a week when we're drafting, um, and we probably should get a little bit more rigid about how we put things together so that we're not scrambling at the end like we always are. <laughs> but but our 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 planning process is basically we know where we're starting and we know where we want the major plot points to end. And then zero drafting is really just a matter of us talking talking it out a lot. Mm -hmm. And we're we're basically just laying track in front of a moving train. Um, and actually, it was only just uh, just like a couple of weeks ago that we we wrote out a synopsis for the draft that we're writing right now and mm -hmm. wrote it all the way to the end. It was a seven thousand word synopsis, which is kind <laughs> of oh, that's a, horrifying. Okay. But um, <laughs> I would say we are not really rigid plotters it's very organic mm -hmm. we're still discovery writers but we do like to know where we're planning to end up and we don't write alternating povs well i it's it, it the story is told through one okay POV. um and we just write in the same paragraph sometimes even at the same time like google docs lets you collaborate and so we are uh we're just very organic in the way that the story gets written. Yeah. Hey, there's some good stuff that comes out of that finger painting. You're like, oh, you know, <laughs> so yeah. So for, from the outside looking in, are there any cultural touchstones that you think are important to have in, in fantasy inspired by Asian culture? Family. Yeah. Family yeah. first was the theme of yeah. uh, these books. And we got a, 
message today on social media from one of our early readers. She's a bookseller. And uh, she said the family aspect of book two was so strong for her that she was like really moved. Um, so Ken and I uh, felt like, okay, like it's working, you know, it's, it's um, resonating for our readers. So family can mean different things. So for instance, if you're writing a book set in the Highlands of Scotland, family is the clan, which is not just nuclear family. Yeah. When you say family with Asian culture, is it nuclear family? So mom, dad, kids, grandparents, or are you talking about a larger branch that might be tribal or clan related? It is clan based in our books, right? Although from a um, on screen time, it might really just be the nuclear element. Um, but, you know, part of what's happening for the protagonist is that she's also building a found family, which I mm -hmm. think is a more modern notion, but functionally it's what we experience ourselves, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think modern readers are so used to moving all over the country where they might not, or nation even, uh, other countries where they might not be near any family. So found family kind of resonates, I think, for a lot of people as a way to replace what you're missing in the in the nuclear family. Um, are you planning on, as you keep going, staying with the same main character, the, the lady, female John Wick, or are you going to branch out to some of the other characters for spinoffs? Yeah, we were just talking about a spinoff the other day. <laughs> It, it's funny. We love our character, Emiko. Like it, someone on Reddit called it Jane Wick, which I loved, right? And um, uh, the publisher, <laughs> the publisher um, has a contract with us for three plus an option. But I think from their perspective, it's complete as a trilogy. I think we have some freedom ourselves after we are complete in our contractual obligations. If we wanted to do like a Kickstarter to keep writing with this character to, um, have prequels, which we have already written. So uh, I don't think we're leaving the world entirely, but I could see that under our option, we might start a new and, and start with a new series for, for this. So uh, Diana, when you write this world that you're envisioning, uh, you're gonna have to come back and talk to us about it um, when it's ready to go. Are you gonna do the, the found family angle or are you gonna stick with the more nuclear traditional family in this? Um, second world fantasy um it, they'll be you know they'll be the extended family you know uh asian family but depending how i want it to end um i'm not sure i'm gonna go with uh found family i mean i have that in my uh science fiction book um it just felt natural for the characters uh, and and how they ended up and I was, and I didn't think about it too much about as far as the impact, you know, on the reader, but um, some of the viewers and um, told me that they really liked that aspect. Um, so, you know, so what Julia was saying about it being modern uh, type of resonate, uh, does resonate, I think, with the current readers. So uh, I would say I would start uh, with the extended family and then 2BD, how they how they end up the main characters. So it'll be based on two sisters. Let's put it that way. Hmm. That's cool. Are they going to get the dragons? Because, you know, fantasy dragons, they kind of go together like peanut butter and chocolate. Yeah. Must have dragons. <laughs> yeah. there. Yeah. There will be some Asian, you know, fantasy uh, monsters. And I, I do, you know, was... You know, like when I was writing the short story, I was like cognizant of doing a little research in that because I guess like one of the critiques of Mulan, like the live action one, not the like original animation one. I mean, I liked both, um, uh, but was that it didn't do as well as they thought in overseas because they had a female antagonist who they referred to as a witch. And it's not that um, Asian fantasy doesn't have uh, female villains or evil female spirits. It definitely does. But they, they generally don't have in a lot of mythology, like witches. It's, it's like not a thing. So they created that for Western audiences. So uh, I'm just going to make sure to do my research to kind of, you know, kind of keep it true to the world. 
Sounds like fun. All right, so this is a topic that's so wide that I don't even know what questions to ask sometimes. So you at home, dear listener, if you have things you want to ask, you can leave it in the comment section, and I can always have these ladies and gentlemen come back for round two, and we can ask more targeted questions. Um, as always, the first episode on any given topic is always very broad brush, um, and then we can always dive deeper later. So, uh, so be sure to do that in the comment section. Uh, with that being said, is there anything, um, Diana, Julia, or Ken, that you think we should cover before we wrap this puppy up? I think we covered food, which was the most important part, so I'm okay. Again, this is why we were friends, Julia. <laughs> Although we didn't talk about Kit Kats yet. Oh, okay. Japanese Kit Kats are just superior. I I don't understand. Like They're not too sweet. Yeah, that's an Asian thing, like that your desserts can't be too sweet. <laughs> it doesn't have rice in it, does it? <laughs> no, uh, just for whatever reason, Japanese uh, Kit Kats, um, it, in Japan, Kit Kats really took off and they are hyper local and hyper seasonal. Um, right. And I think I read an article somewhere where they said that all told there are like 64 different flavors of Japanese Holy crap. Yeah, um, I mean, they're wild. They're amazing. Like, Every one of them do, are amazing. Yeah, and they do like limited edition. Like this is a yuzu sake flavor Kit Kat, right? That kind of thing. Yeah, there's a Japanese sweet potato one that I really want to try. I've, I've read about it, but it's only available for like a month in one city in Japan. See, now you're just being cruel to me because now I want to try all the things and I, I wouldn't even know where to go to get them. I, I know I'm getting hungry. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to like run down to a uh, local, you know, Asian market here. So <laughs> we had one. I don't know if it survived COVID. Now I'm going to have to look and see if they have Kit Kats to see if, if it's as good as Ken says it is. Um, yeah. I definitely think food is something that people forget to throw in books. And I, I'm with you, Julia. That, that's, you could definitely set the mood of any scene, throw a little bit of food. So all right. With that being said, uh, Ken, what are you writing now? Uh, we are writing the finale to the Phoenix Horde series. Um, trucking along towards the ending and hoping that the light at the end of the tunnel is not a train. I like that analogy. Uh, Julia, how's that coming for you? I guess you're writing at the same time, so it's going to be the same answer. Yeah, so Ebony Gate just came out in paperback. And I don't know if you can see this on the camera, but it's yellow. The end papers on. on the paperback are yellow. So, oh, like so it was very exciting to see this out in paperback. Um, Blood Jade, which is behind me in green, is going to come out in hardcover in July. Hold there on. you go. Can, Ken's can you got it. Tell you. Oh, that looks nice. I like that. Wait, there's the new bookmark in there, oh. Ken. You have to show them. <laughs> oh, I like it. Also drawn by my daughter. If she doesn't have a website, she should. She'll get business. That's good. Um, she just wants me to pay her. <laughs> <laughs> Reasonable. In food? I mean, you know. No, 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 cash. Oh, uh, okay. No Kit Kats? All right. She's an Asian kid. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. I still love as an Asian parent with the money. Not, the, not, not so much verbal. That's like verbal abuse. But the, yeah. You know, or, okay. You did something right. Here's some money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> totally. <All right. laughs> and what are you writing at the moment, Diana? Uh, I started on my last book of my sci-fi trilogy, uh, Children of Alfio. So um, I'm waiting for a release date on the second book. I should get it here shortly from my publisher. Uh, but the first book is out now in uh, both paperback and Kindle. Nice. All right, Ken. We're going to list all of this in the show notes, but where can listeners find you, or listeners and viewers find you on the Wild Wilder interwebs? Uh, easiest place to find me is Instagram. Um, I am less uh, present on Facebook and Twitter and um, yeah, Instagram is the main place. All right. And that will be linked in the show notes. What about you, Julia? You know, I've also spent a lot more time on Instagram. It's become like one of my favorite social media places. It's just a lot more fun, uh, low drama, and um, the engagement is really high. So I would say you can find me as Julia V. Writes on Instagram. I'd also say like, don't 
Google my name because um, <laughs> if you get it one letter wrong and it and you type in Julie instead of Julia, you will get a porn star. So like my professional goal <laughs> has been to get more SEO under my own name <laughs> than this porn star. But I, I don't know how many years that might take. I might have to be like Agatha Christie and write until I'm 93. You, in order funny to do story. That. Julia actually did my first interview back before we had the podcast. She did an actual interview for her website back in the day. And I sent that to my publisher and I, I guess I spelled it wrong. It's like, what the hell are you talking to a porn star about your book? And I'm like, they read too, sir. So, and I was like, should I tell her? Like, she probably knows, right? Like uh, that was an awkward conversation with the publisher. So, all right, and Diana, where can they find you on the Wild Wild Interrupts? As usual, all the links will be in the show notes. Um, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, but yes, I am finding that Instagram is is much more of my go-to. It's just, I, I once I figure out how to use it, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot more fun, I think. Absolutely. All right. And with that being said, this is the part of the uh, podcast, dear listener, dear viewer at home, where I remind you to please be kind and speak your mind on the reviewing platforms. Your reviews help the right readers find the right books. So do your part and you can uh, you can support starving artists who want to buy Kit Kats all the way from Japan. Um, and you wouldn't want to be the reason he doesn't get to eat those. So, so you've got to <laughs> do your part. And with that... Uh, you could find us on our link tree, L I N K T R dot E E, link tree slash blasters and blaze podcast, where we link to all the things the bit shoots, the rumbles, the YouTubes, the Twitters, the email, blasters and blade podcast at gmail.com for professional purposes only, people. We have our blasters and blades Facebook group and Facebook page. We have Madden Stabby Stab on the Instagram, Twitter, and email. And finally, we have our new website. Uh, which now that Spotify has bought Anchor, it is very godly good. So just go to Linktree. It makes it easy. But once there, you can support the podcast for as little as 99 cents a month. You can help keep the lights on, or you can support the show more directly at buymeacoffee.com slash author J.R. Hanley. Again, buymeacoffee.com slash author J.R. Hanley. Be sure to put in the comment section this for the podcast. And I promise I will keep my co-hosts duly caffeinated. They will drink that coffee brand coffee until it pours out of their eyeballs. Discount code link is in the show notes. Podcast grunts is the code 10% off. Support an American company making American things if that matters to you. And if not, it's still just good. Uh, and with that, thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For my crazy co-host, I am J.R. Hanley, and this was the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time. We will indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom. Julia, Dan, Diana, Ken, wow, I keep wanting to put A's into E's today, and I, that's not good. Uh, thank you for coming on. This was a lot of fun. We'll have to do this again with more topics. And Julia, you're definitely going to have to send me that reading list because uh, that oh, could be yeah. fun to do some review episodes. Yay. And with that, we are out. <laughs>